The 24-inch M1 iMac has been one of the most controversial product launches in years for two reasons, but neither of them really make or break your purchasing decision like the little secret that Apple conveniently didn't mention at their launch event, which can make a world of a difference in your day-to-day -day use. In this detailed review, I will cover both of those things along with our new findings based on real-world experience after two weeks of using this machine in a wide variety of tasks from simple use all the way up to replacing a more powerful and more expensive 27-inch iMac for professional use. And I'll finish off this video with a key software fix and some clear recommendations on which models and which upgrades you should buy based on your use case, which will either save you money or headaches since we actually purchased two iMacs, a base model and a high-end with twice the RAM and found significant differences depending on what you'll use it for. Now let me warn you up front, I am a huge fan of this iMac, so a lot of this will be very positive, but trust me, I will call Apple out on the few things that are actually wrong with this machine. The 24-inch iMac is the new standard desktop Mac that replaces the long outdated 21.5-inch iMac, and if you're wanting to upgrade from one of those, this new Mac will be a huge improvement in every way but one. Now the first thing you'll notice is the new striking or shocking design. Now I want to spend a little bit more time on this than usual because there's a lot of confusion and controversy on this, which I was also a part of until we actually spent more time with this machine. This is the first time Apple has made such a drastic design change since 2007, where they went from a plastic white bezeled 20 inch iMac to the 24 inch aluminum design that had been slowly and slightly modified since then. This new iMac combines both of those machines along with colors that we haven't seen since the now vintage G3 iMacs from 1998 that I used to use at school as a kid. This new 2021 iMac is a great nod to Apple's heritage all the way back to the original iMac Hello, but it is more premium looking and feeling than before because it's made of all aluminum with a full sheet of laminated glass on the front. The white bezel and color options give this machine a very consumer friendly look, but trust me, on the inside, Apple's M1 chip makes this iMac pack way more of a punch than previous iMacs did for their price, so much so that it beats out my $15,000 iMac Pro in some professional tasks, which never happened with previous entry level iMacs, but more on performance in just a bit. Also, if you're like most people who enjoy our videos but haven't hit that subscribe button, now is a perfect time since you guys can help us reach our goal of 1 million subscribers before the end of the year. We would greatly appreciate it. A ton of people complained about Apple's decision to use white bezels, so much so that third-party companies started making stickers to change them back to black, mostly because black helps you focus on the content of the display, or at least that's what people say. But after using it, I have to say that I am loving the white bezels, at least when using it in a normally lit room and against a white wall that most homes have. After the first day, your eyes get used to it and the bezels blend into the background and it's almost like your content is floating there in mid-air. And in dark rooms, it's not as distracting as I expected because the bezel isn't actually white, but it is gray. What was even more of a controversy was the big chin that Apple left on the iMac. What's inside of there is very impressive, at least on the higher end model, but it is the look that people are hating on. Apple could have easily gotten rid of it and had a nice slim bezel all around, just like the Pro Display XDR, but they didn't. And there's a good reason for it that I now agree with. No, it's not because they wanted this machine to be as thin as possible, which it is so thin that they had to put the headphone jack on the side, but it is because the chin is iMac's standout design feature that is now so iconic that even Windows PC companies have started to make their all-in-one chins larger, all while slimming down their bezel. Ultralinks pointed out best on Twitter, a chin makes the iMac instantly recognizable just like the notch on the iPhone makes it stand out instead of looking like every other smartphone. Finishing off the design, the iMac is modern, friendly, and it definitely looks brand new all while being recognizable even without the Apple logo that I do wish they kept. And no, you can't just use the sticker that is included because it is too big. They made sure that you wouldn't be able to just put it there. The colors are subtle on the front and striking on the back and they're a little bit more bold in person than on Apple's website. Personally, I prefer the classic silver, but overall the design gets a big thumbs up from me and it will stay looking new for a long time. 
Getting into hardware, this is where things start turning for the worst, and I have two main complaints and two minor ones. The first one is the ports. On the base model, we are losing four USB Type-A ports, an SD card reader, and an Ethernet jack. Now, yes, those new Thunderbolt ports are powerful and they can be greatly expanded like we showed off in our OWC Hub video, which you can watch after this one, but that's just one more thing to buy and have to plug into the iMac and into wall power. The high end gives you Ethernet in the power adapter, which is extremely clever, and two more USB Type-C ports that don't support Thunderbolt. In real world use, this has been a pain coming from an older Mac, and we've already been having to plug in and unplug things to make it work. Now, I know that USB Type-C is the future, and this isn't a pro machine, but Apple is rumored to be adding back ports and an SD card reader into the upcoming MacBook, so why not just include that SD card reader here on the side by the headphone jack? The next one is the Ethernet jack that is limited to the much older and slower 1 gigabit Ethernet. Apple has been offering 10 gigabit Ethernet for a few years now, and they just added it as an option to the M1 Mac Mini. So if someone is going to use Ethernet, why not give us the full speed one? On that note, I have to point out how impressive Apple's new accessories are. The tension to detail and everything all the way up to the thick cloth handle on the box is shockingly good for a $1299 base level device. The wires in the charging cable are color matched and braided, as is the cable leading up to the iMac itself, which ends in a new round MagSafe connector that is also color matched and anodized. Even though MagSafe isn't a necessity for a desktop, it's been a joy to use as it connects almost magically, lining up and snapping into place and looking super clean and premium. This would have been the perfect time to finally move the charge port from the bottom where your mouse can't be used while charging, but at least the mouse charges fast and lasts a long time. Onto the keyboard, I absolutely love it and I think it's definitely worth spending the extra $50 to upgrade to the Touch ID version from the base iMax keyboard. Not only can you speed up locking in and make it much more secure, it's also useful for Apple Pay passwords and more in macOS. What's even cooler is if you have multiple people sharing an iMac, you can quickly go to your profile using Touch ID. The updated keyboard also feels slightly better and quieter than my new Mac Pro's keyboard when typing, and my only complaint on the keyboard is that the launchpad shortcut is now gone, so I can't quickly open up the app launcher. To fix this, you can remap a shortcut like the command and spacebar button together, or use the new spotlight shortcut and just search for the app that you need. The next minor disappointment are the speakers. And not because they are bad, they are actually quite good for such a thin machine, but because Apple hyped them up so much by saying that they are the best in any iMac, which I don't agree with. Apple spent a considerable amount of time designing these with six total speakers and vibration canceling woofers that are connected to a very large but super thin enclosure that spans most of the iMac sandwiched between the display and the aluminum chassis. This increases the sound quality and bass response of the speakers, but it's still not enough to make them the best. Go ahead and listen for yourself how they compare to the 27 inch iMac. <laughs> Now sure, it might be better than the iMac that it directly replaces, but they still lack bass compared to the larger iMacs, which makes a big difference for music, movies, and games. They also don't get super loud. For most people, they will do a decent job and you won't need to get dedicated speakers, but I would definitely prefer Apple's previous ones. As far as the display, it is fantastic. We've already talked about the bezels, but the screen is just as color accurate and sharp as Apple's 5K or 6K displays since they've upped the resolution from 4K on the older 21 and half inch to 4.5K to keep that perfect 218 pixels per inch for Apple's Retina rating. 24 inches or 23 and a half to be exact is a great size for a consumer related computer. It is big enough to do everything from web browsing to photo and video editing, and it won't look huge in people's homes. Now, if you're coming from a 27 inch, you will definitely notice a size difference, especially for pro work where you need to multitask. But if you're wanting a downsize, you do get used to the smaller display after a day or two. 
And if you're coming from a Windows PC or much older iMacs, it will blow you away with great detail, colors, and 500 nits of brightness, and great coatings that fight reflections in bright rooms. The display alone is worth at least $700, like LG's ultrafine 24-inch display, which has the same brightness and color accuracy, but has a lower 4K resolution. Above the display is the first 1080p webcam in any Mac under $5,000. Check out the webcam and my quality improvements. This is the webcam and microphone quality on the 2020 27-inch iMac with the 720p FaceTime camera. And this is the webcam and microphone quality on the 2021 24 inch iMac with the 1080p FaceTime camera and the M1 ISP. The image is both brighter and sharper and the microphones are more clear as well. Now I do think that both are a little bit too flat compared to the older Macs, but on the plus side, it makes web conferencing much more clear, which is a good thing. And Apple could still tweak this down the line with software. And now for the biggest disappointment with the new 24 inch M1 iMac, something that can either make or break your experience and even longevity of this machine and something that Apple could have easily fixed for just a few dollars per machine, but instead they didn't even mention it to us. And that is the fact that the base model is purposefully gimped, which makes a huge difference in real world usage. When Apple announced this iMac, they showed off how almost all of the components are stuffed inside of the chin, and the super efficient M1 chip is cooled with only two fans, and they even went as far as saying that under most workloads, it runs at 10 decibels, which is quieter than most background noise. Now all of this is true, but only if you buy the $1,500 model. It is pretty much silent even when doing video or photo editing and even gaming all while the computer stays cool as well, even though the high-end model has more powerful graphics. For the entry-level model though, Apple got rid of one of the fans and it's the one that had a heat pipe connected to it, leaving the left side fan which just blows cool air inside of the system and doesn't have a heat sink, leaving the M1 chip just sitting there heating up like in the fanless MacBook Air. The performance is 10 to 15% worse depending on what you're doing and up to 25% worse if you're pushing both the CPU and the graphics at the same time. Now is 10% more performance on an already fast chip worth an extra $200 if you don't need the other improvements? Maybe, maybe not, but 25% definitely is worth spending more for. So maybe that's why Apple decided to leave out the main cooling component that cost them just a few dollars to include. Because of that, when pushing the machine, the base model CPU runs at an extremely hot 95 degrees Celsius. And when gaming, the graphics core also runs at 95 degrees Celsius. And the only reason they don't get hotter is that the M1 chip is slowed down from the full 3.2 2 gigahertz performance down to 2.5. Now the same thing does happen to the M1 MacBook Air, but the difference is that machine is designed to be mobile, where this is a desktop that doesn't rely on battery power, and the Air is fanless, so it is totally silent, while this still has a single but barely effective fan that spins up often and under heavier productive loads, it runs at full blast, while its M1 chip is running slower and super hot. During most of these tasks, the more expensive IMAX fans are running at their slowest possible speeds while running cool and completely silent and under extreme loads the fans barely spin up from idle. For example, in our red export test the M1 was at 71 degrees Celsius and barely audible compared to the single fan iMac at 95 degrees Celsius and the fan at 7000 RPM. Why do you have to do this to us Apple all while bragging about its great cooling system? On the plus side, the ineffective single fan system isn't extremely loud, but it is definitely audible and annoying. And thankfully, I did find one alternative for those that don't need the maximum performance of the high end, but also don't want a fan that's running at full blast when they push their machine. I used fan control software to manually set the fan at about half speed, which is barely louder than our HVAC noise in our room, and ran the same Cinebench test, which really pushes the machine, and to my surprise, the M1 was only about 5% slower than running the fan at full blast, and the temps were about the same. This proves that the fan is doing almost nothing but making noise, and of course, you can also fine tune the RPM and set up profiles to maximize the performance compared to noise. I'll go ahead and leave a link to the software down in the description below. 
And now let's get into performance, which is really good, especially on the higher end one for two reasons. If you've been keeping up with the M1 chips, you'll know that for certain optimized programs like Xcode, it beats even my $5,000 Mac Pro. And for Logic Pro music production, it performs incredibly well compared to previous Intel models. For these optimized apps, Apple Silicon can beat out processors and graphics that have much more performance. For example, Angelica's 27-inch iMac has about double the graphics performance, but the M1 chip cuts through 4K footage easier and renders video faster due to its dedicated encoders and decoders that also allow to play back the newest, toughest HEVC footage flawlessly, where most computers, even my Mac Pro, can't and have to convert the footage first. Apple even went as far as saying, that it can edit 8K video, which I was skeptical of, but it did in fact edit some 8K footage that I shot with the new Sony A1. Because of this, even though her iMac is technically more powerful, for the type of work that we do, the M1 is actually faster and more efficient. But don't think that this machine will handle anything that you'll throw at it. The issue it runs into is not having enough raw graphics performance when you layer too much effects or if you're working with files or even programs that haven't properly been optimized where more expensive and more powerful Intel machines will be faster. But with that said, every month more programs are optimized for Apple Silicon and in those cases, these lower price machines are incredibly fast and for general use such as web browsing and simple apps, the iMac is incredibly responsive, making my Mac Pro feel slow when I go back to it. For most people looking to buy a 24 inch iMac, even those that do photo and video editing, this machine will do a great job punching way above its weight and most average 27 inch iMac users can downgrade to an M1 iMac, but for those that have high spec models or iMac Pros, I would wait for the larger M1X models to get more raw graphics performance. And now for the buyer's guide section so you guys don't waste your money or make a mistake. To start off, those that are doing very basic tasks like web browsing, email, watching videos, and never doing anything more difficult than that, I would just go for the base model. Eight gigs of RAM is plenty and 256 gigs of storage should be enough space, especially if you use iCloud for photos. Now, if you like convenience or if you have multiple users, I would definitely spend the $50 extra for the Touch ID keyboard, but the $30 more for Ethernet isn't really needed unless you really want to use Ethernet because the Wi-Fi is very fast on this machine. Now for people who want to do some photo and video editing and other intensive tasks like gaming or could possibly do them in years down the line, definitely get the $1,500 model and if you're doing 4K or raw photo editing or you want your machine to last a very long time, I would upgrade to 16 gigs of RAM since that's something that you can't upgrade later. Storage capacity is always a really tough choice because it really depends on your usage patterns. Personally, I go with the smallest capacity because I store my files externally and in the cloud. But if you don't offload files off of your computer, I would see how much storage space you're using on your current Mac or PC, of course, and then get more than that. But it gets expensive very quickly because Apple is only offering ultra fast SSD options that cost a lot more than external SSDs. I'll go ahead and leave my SSD recommendation down in the description below. Overall, the M1 iMac is an incredible machine and it would be perfect if Apple kept the proper right side fan and heatsink in the base model and it would be an absolute steal at $12.99. Unfortunately, or fortunately for Apple, most people should spend at least $1,500, which makes it less of a value, but still a great all-in-one machine, which not only looks great no matter where you put it, but also has a great display, which alone is worth at least $700, a keyboard and mouse that's valued at $200, a good webcam, microphone, and speakers, and of course, extremely good performance with the M1, especially for the money. It does exist exactly what Apple designed it for, a desktop machine that works great for most people. Now, if you wanna see a dedicated comparison against the Intel versions or the base model against the high end, go ahead and check that out right over there and click that circle above to subscribe to help us reach 1 million subscribers before the end of the year. We'd greatly appreciate it. This has been Max and I'll see you in the next video.